memories were a little better, we would sit around and sing these kind of songs all day long. To realize all the times God spared us, rescued us, delivered us, allowed us to be here to give him praise. Everything didn't go the way we wished it had gone in our past. Thank God for the times he didn't let us have our way. Kept us from doing things we felt like doing. Thought we were grown enough to do. <laughs> Great is your mercy. Great is your faithfulness. And today as we share from the word of God on a subject, uh, amazing things happen when we leave vengeance to the Lord. I think it will stir up some more memories for uh, so many of us. Uh, Anita and I were, were walking yesterday. She likes to walk for exercise, I'd rather drive, but you know, <laughs> sometimes you just have to give in. <laughs> but just uh, re reflecting on a time when I wasn't as mature as I am closer to being now, and there was an incident. Uh, she was still in Columbus, I was in Cleveland, and so someone who was less than a gentleman was harassing her and it damaged her car and I feared for her safety. And so I left my job, which I really had no business or right to do, just told my boss I gotta go and he thankfully didn't fire me and took something with me that I had no business taking. And I, as I reflect on I am so glad that God did not let me see that person. Because Lord only knows what might have happened. I know I wouldn't be standing here preaching today. Yeah. And it was all an issue that, that blew over. But the enemy was baiting a trap. Yes. And I almost fell into it. It was only because of the grace of God that yeah. nothing Amen. didn't go horribly wrong that day. And I'm sure all of us have our stories where we, in the moment, thought we were about to do the right thing. And it would have been tragic. Yes. And then you read the word of God, and, and God says, you know, there are just some times you should just let me handle the vengeance yes. part. Yes. You need to pray for wisdom, because you don't know what to do. You know what you feel like doing, but you don't always know what to do. Amen. Amen. And so as we look in the word of God today, we're going to hit some highlights from 1 Samuel chapter 25 and chapter 26 and discuss some amazing things that happen when we let vengeance belong to the Lord. Well, we left off last week. And again, if you want to make a bestseller movie, just First and Second Samuel will get it for you. Every storyline you can imagine is there. So we left off last week after David had graciously spared Saul's life. David, who's been hunted like a dog for years, and he's got his men with him, and they all see, you know, if you take them out now, we can all go home. And David said, I'm not going to touch the man that God has anointed to be king of Israel. I'll let God take care of that. And so chapter 25 opens after Saul has said all the right words, but his heart isn't changed. You, you know how you used to, when you get convicted, but you didn't repent. You said what felt right in the moment, but as soon as you got back out of the situation, it all came back and your course of action had not changed. So David is not through running from Saul. Saul did not invite David back to the court after chapter 24, and he's not going to do it after our lesson today. But chapter 25 starts off with a, a verse that just seems to come up out of nowhere, and it says, Then Samuel died. And the Israelites gathered together and lamented for him, buried him at his home in Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. You need to get a map and look where some of these, these places are, and I'm not going to take the time to elaborate on any of that. I just kind of want to hit some of the, the talking points of the day. Uh, first of all, we, we all need to recognize the importance of the people who encourage us and help us stay emotionally balanced. There's a reason the Holy Spirit let us see here that Samuel died and, and David went down to the wilderness and all Israel 
gather together to mourn. David had always been able to count on Samuel for spiritual guidance. Always been able to count on Samuel for emotional support. His death was a huge loss at a very difficult time in David's life. Again, he's, he's, he's a fugitive, he's on the run, and now all of a sudden, his go-to man isn't there. The Bible says all Israel grieved for Samuel. The entire country was influenced by one man. Stop and think, what kind of legacy are, are you leaving? Yeah. How many lives are really going to deeply be impacted, first of all, because you were here, mm. and then secondly, when you're no longer here? The whole country, even those who really didn't even want to hear the word of God, Samuel had that kind of impact in people's lives. And David is grieving, and it's easy to overreact when we're grieving, isn't it? Amen. And I want to say that's part of the background of what's about to happen in chapter 25. He's grieving, he's lonely, he, you know, his family hasn't been there for him, but Samuel was. Saul's trying to kill him, but Samuel was praying for him and supporting him, but now his emotional support is gone. His good friend Jonathan, they've been separated. So you have to understand the feelings that can come upon someone when they feel that sudden abandonment, the support's not there, and they're going through a difficult time. Okay, you with me? Yes. All right, see, we're in section two already. <laughs> Only a hundred more verses to go. <laughs> Verse two says, Now there was a certain, there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich. Three thousand sheep and a thousand goats. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Nabal, the name of his wife Abigail. She was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. But the man was harsh and evil in his doings. He was of the house of Caleb. When David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, David sent ten young men. David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, Peace be to you, peace be to your house, and peace to all that you have. I've heard that you were shearers. Your shepherds were with us. We didn't hurt them, nor was anything missing from them. All the while they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, they'll tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son, David. So when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words in the name of David, and they waited. We will often be disappointed if we expect people to give an equal return on our investment in them. Rejoice in those who do, and don't overreact to those who don't. Here's a wealthy man. He, he's got thousands of sheep, and, and he's shearing the sheep, and so there's wool, there's, there's produce to be sold, and this was a time when outlaws would come and try to rob what you were about to take to market and sell. And so you just saw that David and his men were protecting people like Nabal and his wealth and his people. David had enough. David's got hundreds and hundreds of men with him. If he was an outlaw, if he wasn't a man of some integrity, he could have robbed him, taken what he needed. You obviously see that he had provisions, they had needs. But he says, no, go tell Nabal. Since we protected your men and your possessions, as wealthy as you are, can you hook a brother up with something to eat and take care of his boys? That's all we're asking. He did it politely. He did it respectfully. He, he said, your son David, 
David's the anointed and future king wow. of Israel. He's coming to him in all humility. Okay? The response is going to be a little surprising. But not when you understand the man you're dealing with. <clears throat> Nabal answered David's servants, verse 10, said, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? Now see, that's a giveaway. He knows he's the son of Jesse. He knows who he is, so he knows something about him. He knows this man is a military hero. The word is that he's been chosen to be our next king. And yet the utter disrespect. Who? David. Who that? <laughs> there are a lot of servants nowadays who break away each one of them from his master. Did you see what he just said? That rebel. That unfaithful, ungrateful. Sir, why should I help him out? He's fugitive. He's a lawbreaker. He, he's got bad intention. Why should I help him out? Verse 11, shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I've killed from my shears and give it to men who I don't know where they're from? But you do know where they're from. So David's young men turned on their heels and went back, came and told him all these words. Verse 13, and David said to his men, every man put on his sword. So every man put on his sword. David put on his sword. And about 400 men went with David. 200 stayed with the supplies. Did I just talk about overreacting? Is this the same man who's been dodging spears from Saul? been chased like a dog in the wilderness and still showed grace to Saul? Now, one offense. One offense. And he say, okay, lock and load is on. One offense. One act of disrespect. And he's ready to kill. See, we've we got to be in touch with who we're spilling on. A lot of times we're dumping our anger and our frustration and our disappointment on the people who really didn't put us in that position. They just happen to be in our lives at the moment to catch what we didn't let the Holy Spirit let us deal with. Sometimes I push back. I catch myself being a little irritable. I may be hiding it from others, but I feel it. And I say, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. And it comes from a long line of things that didn't happen in that moment, but happened before that moment. See, we titled this section about don't be disappointed in people who don't give you a return on the investment. We're coming up on our 19th anniversary. I can't tell you how many people have come in and out of these doors. Probably a couple thousand. I invested in a lot of those people. Some came when they were hurting and in need. And, and as soon as they got what they wanted, gone. Yeah. Not even a goodbye, not even a forwarding address, just gone. And if you're not careful, you stop giving to those who really need you to give to them because you say, well, it's going to be another disappointment, right. going to get used again, right. going to get left hanging again. Right. And then Jesus says, uh, <clears throat> I did that for billions of folks. <laughs> Every once in a while, one of them says, thank you. What do you think you signed up for? <laughs> we have to be careful not to overreact when we're disappointed. 
Some people can't love because they got hurt so many times in the past. Well, I'm not going to let anybody hurt me again. And this may be the one person God meant for you to be with in the first place. Right, right. To help your healing journey. Don't take it out on them. But David's in such an emotional hole, now he feels disrespected. Saul hasn't shown him any respect in 15 years. Right. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> but he's ready to kill Nabal. And not just Nabal. Let's read on. Verse 14. Now one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master. He reviled them. But the men were very good to us. We weren't hurt. We didn't miss anything as long as we accompanied them while we were in the fields. Verse 16. They were a wall to us both by night and day. All the time we were with them keeping the sheep. Now therefore, no one consider what you will do. For harm is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a scoundrel that nobody can speak to him. Think about what just happened. Now, now Nabal's name is, is basically the same Hebrew word that means folly or fool. Now, parents, <laughs> be careful how you name your kids or nickname your children. Well, sometimes they will live down to what you call them. Sometimes you hinder their expectations by calling them names. You're stupid, you're ugly, you're worthless. We really wanted a girl, you know that. We prayed for a girl, God gave us you. Then they don't know how to dress. I've seen grown men who said, you know, my father told me I would never be anything, and they're 40, 50, 60 years old, and in their spirit, they still feel like failures. I don't know where Nabal got his name or nickname, but basically, he's a foolish man. Now, when one of the employees can come to the wife and say, you know your husband's a fool, <laughs> and keep his job, that tells you the kind of man you're dealing with. That, that's what he said. You, you know your husband's a scoundrel. We work for him. You live with him. It's no secret. He's a true French fry shy of a Happy Meal. He just doesn't have it all together. And everybody knows that. Abigail, we need you. Because your husband's about to get all of us killed. Let it be. Abigail is a fine example of how to draw upon grace and wisdom to deal with a difficult marriage partner. Please do not look to your left or your right. <laughs> she did not have the marriage she wanted, but she had the grace and wisdom from God that she needed. Amen. Isn't it amazing how we miss that? We focus on what we don't have instead of God saying, but I've given you all that you need to handle whatever situation I allowed you to be in. She knows she's married to somebody who is very difficult to deal with. Didn't the Bible say she was intelligent, she was wise, she was a woman of understanding, and she was beautiful? And all it said about her husband is he foolish. He got money, but he's foolish. See, the two don't always go together, do they? Hello. Be glad that he or she has a nice checkbook, but if that's all you married him for, you've got hard times coming. Abigail, we need your help. She didn't have the marriage she wanted. And don't forget, back in that day, most marriages were 
arranged. Parents would arrange a marriage with the man they felt would be a good provider for their daughter. And literally there were times that you met your spouse on engagement day. Isn't that terrifying? Yes. Come here, daughter. I want to introduce you to your husband. Seriously? Yeah. I took care of you for 15, 16 years, and now I'm handing the ball off to him. You know, we, we still have the ceremonies where the father or mother gives the bride away to the person who's now supposed to provide that. They literally arrange the marriage. See, we, today, we go and date for 10 years and ask for <laughs> approval and all that. They arranged. And this may surprise you, but guess whose divorce rate is higher? See, sometimes it just boils down to commitment. I didn't even mean to go here today. <laughs> Abigail is a biblical hero, heroine. She shows you how to call upon the grace of God in a difficult situation. Look what she does. 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 18. Abigail hurried and took 200, lo 200 loaves of bread. Two skins of wine, five sheep already prepared, roasted grain, a hundred clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs, and loaded wow. them on donkeys. That's an incredible lady. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot of work. Yeah. But she realized there's hundreds of hungry, angry men yeah. to feed. <laughs> That's a bad combination, isn't it? A hungry, angry man. Amen. Verse 19, she said to her servants, go on before me. See, I'm coming after you. She didn't tell. She did not tell her husband, Nabal. How do you prepare like that? A feast like that? Have the servants go with you, and you can't even tell them. See, she knows who she's dealing with. Verse 20, so it was, she rode on the donkey. She went down under cover of the hill. There were David and his men coming down toward her. She met them. In the providence of God, she gets there at just the right time. She gets there with all this food before David can get to Nabal. Remember a few verses earlier, we read, they're locked and loaded. They're on the way. She prepares this meal with the help, obviously, and gets there before David gets to her husband. Verse 21, David had said, Surely in vain I have protected all that this fellow has in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all that belongs to him. He's repaid me evil for good. May God do so and more also, and more also to the enemies of David if I leave one man of all who belong to him by morning light. Okay, now, I, I grew up in a home where you were not allowed to say any bad words. And some words that really weren't Bad, we're still not acceptable. Right, right, right. So as I was reading the old KJV, and you get to this verse, and the language says, I'm doing this from memory. Anybody have an old KJV? Okay. If I'm not mistaken, the language says, I'm not going to leave one man who urinates against the wall. And that's not the word. He used the word to start with a P. I didn't know the Bible because we weren't allowed to use it. <laughs> to us, that was a bad word. But that's the descriptive language. I'm not going to leave one grown man of Nabal's household. Not one. Over one insult, he's not only going to have Nabal killed, but every employee of Nabal. I just let Saul go over and over. But one dump on Nabal, everybody's about to die. Hmm. Verse 23, Abigail saw David. She dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, bowed down to the ground, fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me let this iniquity be. 
Please let your maidservant speak in your ears. Hear what the words of your maidservant. Please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal's his name and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back, don't miss this, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. And now this present which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive this trespass of your maidservant. For the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord and evil is not found in you throughout your days. The word she's using, Lord, is basically sir. She's being respectful to him. She's taking the blame upon herself. She had nothing to do with her husband's offense. But see how she's interceding. She's calming this angry man's spirit and said, I, I take the blame. I didn't know. Here's what you asked for. And oh, remember what the Lord Jehovah has promised to do through you, young man. Don't throw that away in a moment of vengeance. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life, but the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with Yahweh your God. In the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. Doesn't that kind of remind him of that sling he used, Goliath. <laughs> Verse 30, it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he's spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel, that this will be no grief to you, nor offense of heart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause or that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember me. That's a wise woman. David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed is your advice. Blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who's kept me back from hurting you, if you hadn't come in a hurry to meet me, by tomorrow morning not one man would have been left. David now realizes that God sent Abigail to him. He said, I was so angry. If you hadn't gotten here, I was going to kill your husband and everybody who works for him. Thank you, Jesus, for stopping me from doing what I felt like doing in a moment of rage and anger and disappointment and frustration. It would have been a lifetime of regrets. David didn't get what he wanted from Nabal, but he got what he needed through the Lord. Yes. Turn quickly to Luke chapter 6. See, when we give expecting nothing in return, we will always be blessed by the spiritual return on our investments. Luke chapter 6, we're going to read the part of chapter 6 that some of the prosperity preachers don't focus on, and then we'll read the part they do. The God is a God of balance. We like the one or the other, but he says, no, there's, there, there are a lot of things that look like flat-out contradictions in the Bible if you don't study properly. Luke chapter 6. I'm going to read this whole section so I don't have to turn back to it again. Starting at verse 27. I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other. Diffuse the situation. This is not a punch, by the way. This, this is an insult slap. Where somebody's trying to provoke you and he says, don't let them do that. Just... He's never saying stand there and be a punching bag. This was you know, like taking a glove. I dare you to hit me back. Don't go for that. Okay. You want to take your cloak? Let them have it. 
Give to everyone who asks of you, from him who takes away your goods, don't ask them back. This is why you need context. Some Christians read this without any context, and every panhandler on the street, they're just giving them kingdom money so they can go buy drugs. God never wants you to do that. Amen. Verse 31, just as you want men to do to you, do also to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? The word is actually grace. If you love those who love you, what grace is that? Even sinners can love people who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what grace is that to you? Even sinners can do that. Verse 34. <clears throat> if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, that's what the bank does. <laughs> what grace is that to you? <laughs> Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back, or 28% interest, or 20% interest. <laughs> Love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting 28% interest in return. Is that what it says? Sometimes, as a believer, you give just because it's the right thing to do, and you say, you know what? If I never see this money again, God bless them and meet my needs also. But now we put the money in their hand and say, God be with you till we meet again. <laughs> Sometimes God will be the one paying you back, not the person you let to. Amen. Your reward will be great. You'll be sons of the Most High. He is kind to the unthankful and evil. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Here's the verse we like to preach as prosperity preachers. Give. It'll be given to you. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. Running over will be put into your bosom. With the same measure that you use, it will be measured back. To you. There are those times, wonderfully, where you give something and God gives you so much back, it's a staggering return. Yes. But there'll be other times you will give and give and give and give and give and you feel like I'm getting absolutely nothing back from my investment. That's just the balance of Christianity. You're looking for your blessing from the east and it comes from the west. You're looking for it to come back from the person you gave to and God brings it back from 10 other people yes. who you gave very little to. Yes. But he gets it done, so we trust him. Yes. Let's go back to Samuel and wrap this up. 1 Samuel 25 ends with David acknowledging that Abigail has been a lifesaver. She has intervened. She has kept him from doing something horribly wrong. Then something very interesting happens. Verse 36, Abigail goes to Nabal. There he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. His heart was merry within him because he was drunk. So she didn't tell him anything till the next day. Verse 37, so the next day when the wine had gone from him. None of you can relate to that hangover feeling, I'm sure. His wife had told him all these things that his heart died within him. He became like a stone. Then it happened about 10 days later that the Lord struck Nabal and he died. Now here's the danger from preaching the Old Testament when people don't want to preach the Bible the way God wants it preached, but just want to find points of application to fit their situation. The story is not saying that I want God to give my husband a stroke and a heart attack because he's mean to me. That's not the proper application of this story. God can deal with your spouse in however way he sees fit, but that does not mean that you go home and pray. <laughs> Here I am, Lord. Abigail Jones. 
I'm tired of this fool, Lord. Would you take him out in Jesus' name? <laughs> the point is, God kept David from murder. And murdering a lot of innocent lives. And he took care of Nabal. And that's not on David's conscience. Now that chapter ends with David marrying Abigail. Okay, don't miss this. Letter C. Letter D. Section 2. Scripture records the action of the biblical characters without endorsing every decision they made. David made many choices that cost him dearly, yet the grace of God helped him praise his way through the consequences. See, David had already been given a wife who's now been given away to somebody else because, you know, Saul is like... But he marries Abigail. But verse 43 says he also took a Ahinoam. So... Both of them were his wives. That's what he did. You don't see God telling him to take all these wives. Matter of fact, turn, turn quickly. First Chronicles chapter 3. You're in Samuel. You've got 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings. First Chronicles chapter 3. Are you there? Yep. First Chronicles, chapter 3, verse 1. Now these were the sons of David who were born to him in Hebron. Firstborn was Amnon by Ahinahem the Jezreelitess. The second, Daniel, by Abigail the Carmelitess. The third, Absalom, the son of Mekah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. The fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggah. The fifth, Shephathiah, by Abitil. The sixth, Ethereal, by his wife, Egla. Did you catch that? See, just reading Samuel, you don't even see half of these characters. But David took other wives and had other children. And this is a, a godly man who's in pursuit of God's heart, but he made some bad decisions. Some lustful decisions. And all this came back to bite him. Because well, these sons are going to be fighting each other, wanting to be the next king. These women are going to have issues with one another. God is telling you what he did. He's not saying, I blessed and endorsed all of that. There are always consequences. Always consequences for violating the clear instructions of the Lord. Okay? But this is what happens when we don't take the time to read the whole counsel of God. There's detail that we miss. Okay? People get to First Chronicles and say, oh, I'm not reading all these names. Let me, let me get to the Psalms. All right, I'm going to quickly run through this last thing. In chapter 26, after, after David has overreacted to Nabal, he has yet another encounter with Saul. Now, as you read chapter 26, you'll see that David has another opportunity to take Saul out. I jump down to verse 7. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and there Saul lay sleeping in the camp with his spear stuck in the ground by his head. Abner and the people lay all around him. Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please, let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth. I won't have to strike him a second time. <laughs> David, look. God has answered our prayers. Saul is asleep. His boys are asleep. The spear is right next to him. One time, right through him, stab him in the ground, we can go home. Let me do it, David. I don't have to stab him multiple times. One time. And we're done. David said to him, verse 9, Don't destroy him. Who can stretch out his hand against the Lord anointed, the Lord's anointed, and be guiltless? As the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him. 
or his day shall come to die, or he'll die in battle. Did he learn something from Nabal? Yes. Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but please take now the spear and jug of water that Abias had and let us go. David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head, and they got away. No man knew or saw or awoke. Catch this, bottom of verse 12. They were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. You know, it's not unlikely that they could have awakened while they're in there trying to take their weapons. That could have gotten very ugly. But God put them in a deep sleep. So that didn't happen. So as you read the rest of chapter 26, you'll see that David gets a distance from the people and he calls to Abner and he calls him out and says, basically, what kind of bodyguard are you? You see me standing here with the king's sword and it's your job to protect him? What kind of bodyguard are you, Abner? I could have killed him. Now take note of that because later on, David and Abner are going to have some issues and I think it goes back to David calling them out. Okay? <laughs> Once again, Saul feels conviction without real repentance. Verse 21. Saul says, I have sinned. Return, my son David. I will harm you no more because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. David answered and said, Here's the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and get it. May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today. But I would not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And indeed, as your life was valued much this day in my eyes, so let my life be valued much in the eyes of the Lord. And let him deliver me out of all tribulation. <coughs> Abigail's words are still ringing in David's spirit. She, she told him, you know, the Lord is going to build you an established house. You're going to be king and your sons are going to succeed you. And she's basically saying it in the past tense. She had that kind of faith. She had that kind of understanding and God's promise. And David is starting to realize, okay, maybe, maybe God is going to bring this to pass. Now I say that because next time you're going to see in the very next chapter, he gets, gets so depressed, he thinks all still going to kill him. See, when you're under stress all the time, you have those emotional ups and downs. God brings you through something and you have victory and then two days later it's like, you know, life is just falling apart and not even God can get me out of this. And, and what's the point? See, we need to recognize all the dynamics that are bringing us to these decisions and these words that we're saying because we've not dealt with the stress and the pressure and the emotional disappointment. And we start handling our relationships in horrible ways. David, once again, spare Saul. I'll hit these bullet points and we close. God may want you to destroy your enemies by showing Christ-like love to them. Let his grace overwhelm your natural reaction. That's what David does. Some people will be labeled EGR, extra grace required. Because they seldom keep their word and they frequently cause us grief. Choose to let Christ show you how to deal with recurring attacks when you try to forgive. There are going to be those people in your life where you, with all good biblical intention, you, you want to forgive them, you desire to forgive them, you take all the biblical steps, but then we are emotional people. And the feelings come back. And we have to rehearse that over again and over again, however many times it takes so that you don't overreact and sin because of how you feel. Our friends will often have a one-dimensional viewpoint of how God works. He may deliver our enemies into our hands, but he may command us to help them rather than harm them. David's bodyguard, one of his bodyguards, said, God has answered our prayers. Saul's right here for us to kill. David realized God has answered our prayers by protecting us, yes. keeping Saul from killing us, and yet I don't have to kill him. 
Yes, there's those times when believers do have to fight and fight a fight to death. But you need to know every individual situation based on the Word of God and the will of God. Okay? You can't love your enemies without the grace of God. Can I keep it real? You struggle to love your friends. <laughs> Let alone your enemies. That takes the grace and love of God flowing through your heart. Forgiveness is a gift that we all need. And we receive a blessing every time we choose to share the gift we've received from Christ. Set others free so you can experience freedom in the process. Forgiveness is not easy. God had to incarnate himself, leave heaven, yeah. die on a cross, and rise from the grave to make forgiveness possible. It's not easy. It's impossible without the power of God flowing through your life. But if you don't learn to forgive, you're going to be like David and Nabal, ready to kill somebody over a minor offense. Destroying relationships because of what somebody else did to you, not the person in front of you. But if you've not received forgiveness, you can't pass it on to them. And if we're really struggling, maybe we've heard about the Lord, read about the Lord, come to church, given our money, but never really received the life of Christ in our heart. We're about to fellowship around the Lord's table. It's a time of remembrance for those of us who have been born again and washed in the blood of Christ. It's time to remember that God loved us so much that he not going to leave us the way he found us. He's going to perfect us in Christ. We're all on a journey. We're not as far down the road spiritually and emotionally as we'd like to be, but thank God he doesn't leave unfinished projects. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the lesson that we've learned. We thank you, Lord, that you're teaching us to allow you allow you to execute vengeance in your time to keep us, Lord, from making decisions and actions that we would regret all the days of our lives. Father, as we prepare to commune together, we thank you that we can be reminded of your great love for us and that because of that great love and that amazing grace, we get to enjoy life to its full billions and billions and billions and billions of years and that's just the first day lord help us keep perspective as we go through the challenges of day-to-day -day living and we thank you in jesus name. Amen. amen let's prepare to commune together